So let's talk about Halo and 343 Industries. And apparently 343 Industries is just not a great place to actually work at if you are a game developer. I will throw up some reviews of 343 Industries by employees and past employees of 343 Industries. And apparently it's not looking too great for uh 343 Industries because apparently from all these people that have came out about 343 Industries, it's not really a great place to uh, actually work at. And honestly, this doesn't really surprise me as a whole because I do know in the game industry, there are a lot of bad companies out there in the game industries. I remember last year, Kotaku actually did an article about some uh, game developers and game uh, companies in the game industry that aren't that good at all. They treat their employees really badly, but I mean, it does make sense if you think about it just because games need to get delivered on time and the easiest way for games to not get delayed since games are are really big and take a long time to make is by treating their employees badly. Apparently what goes on behind the scenes with these game companies, not all game companies of course, but a lot of these game companies actually give their workers like bad hours, they work around the clock, they don't really get any time off. Uh, for family, I heard on the weekend, sometimes they still have to work. Overall, it cannot be the greatest experience for these people who are uh, in the game industry and who have to uh, work for these game game companies and honestly i'm not really uh too happy about this honestly because of course everyone deserves a, a good workplace and by treating your employees like crap a lot of times they may rush these projects and at the end of the day it's not really going to help their game uh, it's actually going to hurt their game if you think about it because a lot of these people are just going to be cranky employees, upset employees, and of course they'll be making the game not as good as if they actually had some pretty good conditions to uh, actually work in. And a lot of time, even though uh, the company thinks they're doing themselves a favor by actually, of course, uh, treating their employees badly or rushing their employees to get these games done on time, a lot of times I've seen it in the game industry time and time again where these games come out and they're just not that great of game. A lot of times they're missing content or the content that you have there is just not great because they rushed their employees and their employees really didn't have enough time to actually finish it or they were just in shuts a uh, bad mood of course it really didn't help the uh, situation out honestly i'm okay if games have to be delayed i know some people don't want to hear about their favorite upcoming game being delayed because people want to play these games but you do have to give these employees a chance and you do have to make sure these employees can work under very good conditions it is kind of a shame that a lot of these game companies not just game companies but companies in general don't treat their employees as good as they can and apparently that's what's going on at a 343 industries i mean i am kind of surprised about it because i never thought specifically it would be coming out of 343 industries but again i'm not surprised because i've heard it time and time again with companies like ubisoft with ea and other companies out there they do treat their employees so badly that it makes them actually want to actually quit their company and make them not want to work for that company and if i was in their position honestly it would be very rough I don't know if I would actually want to continue on in their uh, situation just because a lot of their situations are just so bad. And is it actually worth the money that you're actually getting at these companies if you have to work all these really bizarre hours and get treated like crap just to make these games actually come out? It's kind of unfortunate. It really does seem like at the end of the day, a lot of these game companies aren't necessarily making a, a product that they're actually... Uh, wanting to uh, produce and feel happy about. They All they really do care about is money at the end of the day. And if they can make as much money as possible, that's really what they're all for. So for us as consumers, we really shouldn't support these practices. Like maybe when a game comes out, for instance, uh, you should probably boycott the game by not buying the game on day one to show these to show some of these game developers, hey, you're treating your employees badly. We don't really... Uh, we don't really think that's the right thing to do. So by not buying the game on day one, it might show them, well, sales are down and maybe it wasn't the best idea to actually rush your game uh, to the market just to make sure you're, uh, just to treat your employees extremely bad. And honestly, I 
am one of those people that would support practices by not buying a game on day one just to show these game companies that, hey, you don't have to treat your employees like crap. Even if you delay a game, we'll still buy this game if it's a good a good product. And as long as the health of your employees are good, that's all we actually uh, really care about at the uh, end of the day. And it is too bad a lot of these things are coming out about 343 Industries. I really thought their situation uh, was going to be a little bit different. But to be honest, who knows if all this stuff that's coming out about uh, 343 Industries, of course, is actually legitimately real or fake because, of course, some people couldn't necessarily be coming out just because they're mad for one reason or another. So they do like these fake uh, articles that do come out. But there are a couple of them that are actually out there that do state that uh, 343 Industries is not the play not the best uh, game developer to actually work for, unfortunately. And it is uh, not too good as well just because Halo is also one of the biggest franchises of all time when we actually think about video games and if their employees are being treated really badly that does mean at the end of the game day Halo may not be as good as it could be just because they're uh, employees are under a lot of stress from the company and are being mistreated in a lot of different ways and that's honestly not great news at all so there's the situation with Halo Infinite that actually also if you think about it, might actually explain why Halo Infinite doesn't look as good as it could be, why so many people out there keep saying, oh, this game doesn't look actually like a next-gen game. They could actually be doing something a little bit more graphically demanding for this game. But again, you do have to keep in mind, uh, we don't know if it's not because uh, they're just treating their employees bad. It could also be because maybe the pandemic caused this whole situation to uh, go under. Maybe they had to use... Uh, a very early build of uh, Halo Infinite to just get it out there so people would at least know this thing's already far into development. It's kind of like something is better than nothing. So maybe that's why they uh, actually did that. Who really knows what's going on with Halo Infinite, but Halo Infinite is shaping up to be a very interesting game and a very bizarre game at that as well when we actually think about uh, Halo Infinite. Now, the next one up on my list is actually about the upcoming Samsung Galaxy Z Fold 2 because it looks like we do got more information on uh, Samsung's upcoming uh, uh, foldable phone. And it looks like it is going to be the successor to the Samsung Galaxy Fold that did come out, I think, last year. So it did come out 2019. And, uh, of course, with that phone, that was Samsung's uh first uh, foldable phone altogether and that one was one of the worst uh, foldable phones of all time just due to the fact that it was their first attempt at a foldable phone but alongside that it did actually have a lot of issues it had so many issues they actually had to delay that device a couple of months and then actually re-release it uh to the public and to uh everybody and that was kind of a shame but now they're uh back at it again of course i think uh early this year they did release the samsung the other Samsung foldable phone, I think it was the Z uh, Z Flip, I do believe, and that one was a different take on a foldable phone. If you look at the Samsung Galaxy Fold and the Samsung, uh, the Sam the other Samsung foldable phone, you will notice that they are two different devices. One folds up like a traditional smartphone, but then the other one actually folds up more like a tablet style. So you can see they are very uh, different devices at that. But here we go with more leaks and rumors of the upcoming uh, Galaxy Z Fold 2. Now, the biggest thing from this, from this uh, smartphone is the fact that we are going to be getting a bigger display on the outside. And for a while now, this device has been rumored. And they did show some pictures maybe a couple of months ago where they actually showed the device. But the device looked like it was going to have a very small outside screen. And honestly, for me personally, I would not be uh, all too happy about this just due to the fact that if you look at what the Galaxy Z Fold is supposed to be, it's supposed to be a, a smartphone at the end of the day. So why would you have the outside screen? Screen be a very uh, small screen. It just honestly doesn't make sense to me. You would think they would want to make a, a pretty big outside uh, display so you can actually have a usable, functional smartphone on the outside. And then when you open it up, you'll have that big 
tablet-esque uh, screen where you can do things like multitasking. Maybe this time they can implement things like an S Pen because I can really see an S Pen being really useful on a device that's supposed to be more like a tablet style. And of course, with a drawing or with writing, taking notes, those type of applications, I really do think that a uh, S Pen would actually be very nice for this device. But looking at this device, it really does look like it's going to be a very nice improvement over the original Galaxy uh, Fold that came out in uh, 2019. So it came out last year. Looking at this device, the biggest improvement to this one, according to this rumor and leak, is just the fact that if you look at it, the outside screen is much more bigger than what we had before. I don't think it looks as big as something like a, a traditional smartphone if you use a traditional smartphone. So unfortunately, you'll still be getting an inferior uh, smartphone uh, on the outside. But of course, the big benefit to this regardless is going to be the fact that you will have a smartphone you can use uh, as a regular smartphone. And then also you can open this up to get a tablet. And I think that's where the advantage comes with these foldable phones, especially the one that Samsung makes, the uh, Galaxy Fold line. I'm a person that really Really loves the Galaxy Fold line more than any other uh, foldable phone on the market right now. I just think it's really useful to have a traditional smartphone on the outside, but when you open up the uh, smartphone, you do get a tablet. I just think there's a lot of applications you can get with a, a bigger screen on the inside like that. Like for instance, if you do a lot of multitasking with multiple windows open, or maybe you do a lot of multimedia stuff, like you watch a lot of videos and things like that, where you would need a bigger screen on the uh, inside at the end of the day. It's kind of like a device I kind of picture as one of those devices that can actually replace a traditional smartphone and replace a, a tablet as well. It's kind of bridging the gap again. I know for the longest time, tablets were supposed to be in between something like a traditional uh, laptop and a, a regular smartphone, but now the gap's a little bit different now just due to the fact that we have another device in the mix alongside tablets and, of course, alongside devices like laptops, of course. I think this could be the all-in-one device for a lot of people, and I really do think this could actually replace a laptop in some uh, certain scenarios if you needed to get some real work, even though this is, again, a mobile OS. We're not talking like Windows on the Galaxy Fold line or Mac OS or anything too crazy like that. Just the fact that Android is a pretty open-ended uh, OS compared to other things on the market. I really do think that this could replace a laptop for uh, some people if you need to get some real work done or at least be a device that's your only device. I could actually see that. Another thing... Uh, from this leak apparently is it is going to have three different cameras on the back i know with today's technology and with today's smartphones and tablets it's always about having more cameras so of course the galaxy uh fold 2 or the galaxy z fold 2 is going to have more cameras on the back it looks like from this picture it is actually going to have three cameras uh on the back instead of your standard uh, one camera. So that is very interesting. They are taking their cameras very seriously in their foldable line as well. And then it looks like we are going to know the uh, specs of this. It looks like the display uh, right here is going to be 7.7 .7 inches for the internal. And it looks like for the uh, outside one, I want to say, it's going to be 6.2. Two, three inches, so 6.3 inches roughly, somewhere around there. And that's definitely more screen than we had uh, had on the original Galaxy, uh, Galaxy uh, Fold uh, foldable smartphone because let's face it, when we look back at the original Galaxy uh, Fold that actually came out last year, that thing actually uh, didn't actually have a really big screen on the outside of the device. So it's kind of like when you were using it as a traditional uh, smartphone, just closed uh, flat, there really wasn't too much you can do with it just because the experience was actually inferior to what you would get on a normal smartphone. So it's kind of like, why would you ever really close it? It's kind of like if you close the device, you're just going to be doing things like maybe checking your email really quickly, maybe browsing the web really quickly, but there wasn't that many applications you can do on it just because that screen was slightly smaller again than what you would get on a traditional smartphone. So it's kind of like you might as well have the whole uh, a uh, foldable phone opened up at all times to take advantage of that tablet-esque mode that the uh, 
Galaxy Fold is actually known for, of course. Now, it looks like there is no price point for this thing, but it looks like this thing is actually coming soon. It looks like the Galaxy Z Fold 2 will also have a pretty premium uh, smartphone chip on it. It looks like it's going to have the uh, Snapdragon 865 Plus chipset, and it looks like we're actually talking about a pretty beefy battery in this device as well, if all these rumors... And of course, these speculations are actually real. It does look like this smartphone is going to have a uh, 4,356 milliamp battery with 15 watt wireless charging. So that's actually going to be uh, very impressive. And overall, I think this device looks a little bit more premium than the original one. It really looks like they're kind of figuring out how this thing is going to uh, look. The big question with this device and with all the foldable smartphones that are currently on the market how is the durability of this thing actually going to be? Because that, of course, is going to be the big make it or break it for this thing, regardless of price, of course, even if they get this thing down to a much more lower price, because the problem with folding phones as a whole, most of the time, at least in the current state that foldable phones are in, foldable phones are very expensive. They're mostly exp more expensive than their uh, regular uh, smartphone counterpart and for a lot of people they just can't justify the price especially when a lot of times they may have lesser specs than their uh, regular smartphone counterparts or the biggest problem is the durability of these things with a hinge that has to close in and out on a daily basis how many folds can it take before these things actually break under pressure or for instance can dirt and dust get under the hinge of these things and when dirt and dust really do get under uh neat the uh the hinge of these things, I really do think it doesn't uh, leave a really good impression for a lot of people because, of course, how long are these things actually going to last? Because let's face it, if you're buying a phone over $1,000, most of the time you want to keep these devices for four, five, six years. So, of course, I don't blame people out there who may be turned away by these devices just because the durability is not that good. And that's really the, the biggest key feature. So let's hope with the Galaxy Z Fold 2, the hinge on this thing is much more better, but not just the hinge we have to worry about. I'm also really concerned about the display, not really the outside display more so. I'm more concerned about the uh, inside display just because of course the inside display of this thing doesn't actually look like it may not hold up because let's face it, uh, on the uh, Galaxy Z Flip, I do believe that came out this year. At, uh, Samsung was like, yeah, we made one of the most durable uh, screens out there on the actual device. But lo and behold, when that thing came out, it still has problems. It can get scratched up really easily. And, on, and to top it all off, of course, it really wasn't a thin piece of glass. I think it was plastic as well. It had a plastic uh, layer over the uh, glass inside. So you can see that just doesn't mix and that's really again the biggest problem with these smartphones alone is just the fact that the durability is going to be the big question and this is really going to be the make it or break it I feel like with a lot of people who are interested in these style of phones if they can get the durability down to a science where it's a little bit more durable then I'll be pretty happy as well and it also looks like with the Samsung uh, Galaxy Z Fold 2 from uh, Samsung it does look like they will be supporting 5G but don't get your hopes up with all this 5G uh, uh, talk in the uh, tech industry just because 5G is really not prevalent now it's not mainstream a lot of companies say they have 5G but it's really like a 4G plus S thing and a lot of times a lot of times the speeds aren't there but then of course the reliability is not there too even if you can get true 5G speeds a lot of times your area doesn't have it or your area has it but the signal is just all over the place you'll be going from 4G speeds to 5G speeds back to 4G speeds and sometimes it's just a mess when it comes to 5G but I guess it is nice that a lot of these new products are going to be future proof of course just because, of course, you want to keep these devices as long as possible. And a lot of people do keep their uh, tech for a very long time. So it is nice to have uh, future proofing ability like uh, 5G and things like the upcoming uh, Galaxy Z Fold 2. So that's actually going to be uh, very interesting. Overall, it really does look like a very nice device from Samsung. We'll have to wait and see when this thing actually hits the market how well this is going to do, especially in regards to the uh, durability. 
Now, the next one on my list is, is actually about a gaming computer because apparently, yes, apparently Konami is going to be making a gaming PC. And yes, we're talking about the same Konami who is known to make games like the Metal Gear games, Silent Hill, uh, the other games that they have made uh, in the past. I'm trying to think of a game another game franchise that they are known for yes i think they are known for uh castlevania as well so you can see they are known for some pretty big uh games uh in the gaming industry so it is very interesting that they're that they're a software developer for video games but now they're moving into building their own pcs and here's apparently what the actual uh, pc is actually going to look like i don't think we got too much uh details on this it looks like the name of this thing is going to be called the air air spear air spear gaming pc and it looks like it's going to cost 184,800 yen and that translates roughly to 17 hundred dollars in u.s currency so you can see this thing is a very premium uh gaming pc it's not for a budget build or anything like this and the design of this thing actually does look very uh, premium to be honest it looks very cool they actually have a window around the gaming pc so you can see in the gaming pc and the logo is actually pretty big on the actual window of the pc air aerospear airspear i think it's called or aerospear so overall it looks like a very interesting uh gaming pc i wonder what made uh konami actually interested in of of course making a, a gaming pc because I would never guess in a million years that a company like Konami would actually want to venture into the world of gaming PCs, of course, since the competition is already hot. And honestly, you just never guess it because they do make uh, or they do develop uh, games, of course. But I guess it's not too weird considering they do develop games. So the translation is there. The correlation is there. Video games, of course, have to be played with some type of hardware. And, of course, video games can be played on gaming PCs. And so it is a nice mixture. But, again, I would never thought Konami would actually want to make a gaming PC. And it looks like here are some of the specs for this thing. For $1,760, US you are going to be getting an Intel i5 nine four i5 9400f cpu a nvidia gtx 1650 graphics card you will be getting eight gigs of ram and 512 gigabytes of ram so it looks like it's going to be a pretty decent uh gaming pc i don't think this gaming pc obviously is for everybody because looking at the price tag the price tag of this thing is a little bit too expensive i don't know what markets this thing is actually going to be in is it going to be available in like the u.s market in north america or only in japan i think as of right now it may only be in uh, japan as we speak and it looks like they are reportedly again i have to make this clear reportedly because who knows if this is real or not but reportedly this thing is due to ship in september so you will have a couple of months to wait for this thing to actually come out on the market but it is very interesting konami does have their name slapped on a uh, gaming pc and overall this does look like a very uh cool pc from uh, konami i can't really say uh anything the one thing i am actually very interested in why are you paying uh one thousand seven hundred and i think sixty dollars for this pc but this pc only has eight gig of ram because the thing is in 2020 for a lot of triple a games honestly not just me myself but a lot of people in the gaming industry and who build gaming pcs agree that you should at least have a bare minimum of 16 you can get by with 8 gig but if you want to future proof yourself and a lot of games just recommend bare minimum 8 it's probably at least better off to at least go with 16 gig of ram and considering how much ram costs a day it's not that much more to go from 8 gig of ram to 16 gig of ram at least put 12 gig of ram in this thing come on 8 gig of ram but maybe they're assuming that maybe you'll be able to open this thing up and actually customize this down the road but for 1760 dollars that is quite expensive for just uh 8 gig of ram to be honest i wish they could have done something else with the ram oh it actually looks like they are going to have excuse me two skews of this i didn't actually uh pay attention all too clearly they are going to have two skews of this so disregard what i just said about low ram so the 1700 model roughly is going to be 8 gig of ram 512 an i5 uh, cpu with a gtx 1650 and then the uh 
the uh, the higher model, which costs three grand, is going to have Intel i7 9700, a NVIDIA RTX 2070 Supercard, and 16 gig of RAM. So, of course, if you want the best one money can buy, you're definitely going to want to go with the uh, Intel i7 one, of course. That one is going to be more capable. But even for going back to that $1,700 price tag, I would have thought, that they would, of course, at least went with 16 gig of RAM because I'm assuming it wouldn't cost that much to put 16 gig of RAM in this thing because 8 gig is still stretching it in uh, in today's video games and things like that just to have that little bit more security when you're playing all your games. And most of the time when you buy a gaming PC, let's face it, you keep these gaming PCs for many, many years. And since you keep these gaming PCs for many, many years, it would have been really nice to get... Uh, 16 gig of ram on the base model of this uh pc now the next one on my list for today's episode is actually going to be about revel revel suspends its electric moped service in new york city after two people are killed and i do know there is a lot of different services out there when it comes to like those uh electric scooters that you stand up on and then you actually uh pay for and then you actually use those and those things can be pretty uh, useful and be pretty helpful with your day-to-day -day life. And if you need to get places really uh, fast without having to worry about maybe an Uber or maybe a taxi or even driving your car. But I do know a lot of times with a lot of these different services that are out there, the demographics are a lot of young people. And since there is a lot of young people actually using these services, I'm not really too surprised that some people were actually... Uh, got injured or got killed on these uh, electric uh, mopeds. Now these electric mopeds are much more serious mopeds. They're more of those ones you would buy if you were a serious rider. They're, they pretty much mimic a, uh, a motorcycle style. They're not really the ones that are the ones you stand up on. Those ones are a little bit more easier to actually uh, drive and they're actually used just because you just stand up on them and they have a lever. But since these are actually like real full mopeds that you sit down on and they're very big like a motorcycle, I can see a lot of people getting this thing and not really understanding how to ride them because let's face it, a lot of people out there who are getting on these for the first time probably don't have like a motorcycle license or were even trained to use these so of course they're going to probably fool around on these and a lot of times not just let's say for instance people not knowing how to drive these or ride these it's just the fact that a lot of these people who get on these type of vehicles don't necessarily care about people they just want to like fool around on these things and honestly i'm not really too surprised because i've seen a lot of stupid videos on the internet where people take those bird scooters or those lime scooters and they just like messing around on those scooters they like riding them around for a little while just screwing around and honestly that's not too good honestly if i was this company i would have never started something like this because i think it's a little bit too risky for the type of demographic that these cater to for the fact that again a lot of people aren't trained to use these a lot of people screw around on this type of device. It's just really not that not these type of devices that people should be using and this service should not be a thing and if they are going to have a service like that it should be a little bit more stricter about how they go about letting people rent these uh type of scooters just due to the fact that again not everyone knows how to ride them and a lot of people are just messing around they should put stricter laws in place where maybe you need a motorcycle license or maybe you need to go through some type of training really quickly to actually use these things because again a lot of people don't know how to ride these and and they're not trained and of course we're talking about a big city apparently like new york and if these are in new york new york is very big it has a lot of traffic not only does it have a lot of traffic a lot of times with uh new york a lot of people are stupid and they like riding these things on the sidewalk and things like that and of course that doesn't translate good when you're actually riding this thing on the sidewalk just because New York is very busy and it's a very populated city. So why would you want to do that? But I've seen actually a video recently of these scooters and somebody was doing just that. I seen them throttle the gasoline and they were actually for some reason on the actual sidewalk with a, with a, with a moped this big. I don't honestly understand why would anybody in the right mind even want to be on the sidewalk with this thing because where are you going to use it? It's not like you have anywhere to go with this thing. And a lot of times, mostly they are illegal on the sidewalk. So it just boggles my mom, my mind why somebody would do it. But again, it's really that demographic who uses it. It's mostly a lot of those young teenagers or young adults who are just 
don't know what they're doing or again just want to mess around on these scooters not to say that everybody who uses these of course are teenagers or young adults but more and more i see all these different uh incidents and most of the time or a lot of times they are young adults or people who are teenagers who really don't know what they're doing with these they just want to ride them around for fun and mess around and that's not the good way to go honestly they should probably get rid of these because they are dangerous and they shouldn't just allow anybody off the street to rent these things because these things could actually cause people to die just like in this instance two people were killed on this uh, moped riding service which is not great the next one on my list is actually about a new leak for the PS5 and apparently this new leak actually reveals the PS5 to actually be a system where you can actually customize it. Apparently the shell of the actual system is going to come off of the PS5 and you can change it with other shells so it will have some type of customization. Again, these are rumors and speculations. You always have to keep that in mind when you're looking at these but I do like talking about these because again, they're very interesting and a lot of times they do actually come true. That's why I like covering these things honestly and this one is pretty interesting just because this actually reminds me of some other systems in the past that you couldn't necessarily customize the whole shell of the system but you could uh, customize parts of the system like for instance going back to like the Game Boy Micro if you ever use the Game Boy Micro they did have face plates that can go off and on the Game Boy I guess that's kind of similar to what we had uh, with the 3DS, if you remember the new 3DS, the small version of the new 3DS, they actually have had custom customizable face plates on that as well. And then you look at something like the uh, Xbox 360. And of course, the Xbox 360, at least the original model, when they first launched that, it did have face plates on the front of that as well. And I actually own that device, and it was kind of cool that you could use different face plates on it because uh, it just gave your uh, system a little bit more personality. And I did own a couple of different face plates for my original Xbox 360. I think, honestly, I remember when I actually had a blue... Uh, Xbox 360 faceplate and it was pretty badass that I was interchanging these things and it really ma made it feel like the Xbox 360 was mine. It's kind of like building your own gaming PC of course. You do have all that customization with if you want to put like RGB lights on it, if you want to have a window on your case, what color can the case be and things like that. So you do get more customization and usually when it comes to uh, game consoles you really don't have any customization so the machine itself doesn't really feel personal to you as a person just because you really can't customize it all too much. You usually buy these things. They just sit under your TV, but you don't really change the look and design of it. It's pretty much stock from what the company wants you to uh, have for the gaming uh, console. So it's pretty uh, interesting that apparently they're going to actually allow you to change the shell of this. Again, keep in mind, these are only rumors and speculations at this time. But if this is actually true, this would actually be really cool. Unfortunately, just like some other game consoles that actually allowed you to change, like for instance, going back to the face plates, I thought that was very cool. A lot of people didn't even use them. And on different models and things like that. They were kind of really like a gimmick more so than actually something that most people or most consumers actually use. I don't think Xbox 360, they used a lot of those. I don't remember a lot of my friends actually having a lot of face plates. I know at stores, they didn't have a lot of face plates. I do remember. So this may be something that they implement, for instance, uh, with the PS5, but then not really utilize it all too well. They may just have it out there. They may start using it for a while but then maybe discontinue it especially since it already is pretty much confirmed at this point every uh, console does not just get one console in its lifespan every console known to man pretty much gets different versions of it of course most likely we'll get like a ps5 slim or a ps5 pro maybe even potentially so if they're uh, going to be doing things like that of course most likely they'll probably move away from this uh design where you can customize the system when they move to another system it's probably like well not many consumers actually used it we thought it would be a cool little thing to actually uh, implement with the ps5 but then we're not going to use it so yeah i can actually see that thing actually not really taking off we'll have to see how well they actually uh implement this thing because i can see them 
implementing this thing and then it just not taking off for one, for a couple of reasons. Maybe it's uh, too expensive or maybe it's not too expensive, but they're hard to get these things. Or when you finally get these things, it's not convenient for the user to actually remove these things off and on or change it all together, the design of your system. And then you're like, well, I'm not going to waste my time actually uh, using it because it's just a little bit too complicated. And most people who probably buy these systems honestly just want a gaming system under their TV or under their monitor and things like that and they just want to use them so who knows how well this is going to work or if this is even real but that is pretty cool that the ps5 may be highly customizable with all this different outer shells and things like that which is actually a uh, pretty interesting i'm personally kind of interested to see how they would actually implement this and how many people would actually use this am i a person that actually wants this Honestly, I'm not a person that's like wanting this feature that badly because when it comes to me and my devices, a lot of times I don't necessarily really customize my device. I don't mind it being stock, but then again, it is kind of nice to have something that's a little bit more personal to you and not everybody owns just because you want to make it feel like it's your creation or your device as a person since, of course, you will be using this on a daily basis most likely. So most likely you want to make sure this thing feels personal to you on a personal Personal level in different ways with the whole uh, customization of course now the last one on my list uh, for today's episode is actually gonna be about the Sony PlayStation 5 because it looks like Sony is actually pushing their Bravia TVs for the PS5. Basically, they have some TVs uh, set aside for the PS5 that say, hey, listen, these are the TVs from our company that are going to work best with the PS5. And they have a couple of models out there on the uh, interweb that they're actually talking about that are going to be good for the uh, PS5. It looks like in the US, the best model to buy that's actually equipped for all the features of the PS5 and is actually going to play nicely uh, with the PS5 is actually going to be the Sony Bravia Z8H in the US. They also do recommend this other model, ZH8, but the ZH8 is actually not going to be available in America from what I'm looking at right now. And don't get that confused with the Z. 8H. The ZH8 and the Z8H are both different devices. Again, the one that's that's going to be sold in America from what I'm known as is the Z8H and not the ZH8. I know it's really confusing because they sound so similar to one another, but they are different. I can guarantee you that. And then there is another model in America that is pretty much they're saying is the best one to buy. Uh, for the PS5, if you're trying to uh, get a TV that's going to be uh, ready for the PS5 launch, you're going to need the X900H. The X900H is also apparently another Sony Bravia TV that's going to be good for this. And it's kind of interesting that Sony is actually trying to push these TVs on people because for a while now, Sony hasn't really been pushing their TVs all too much, especially for the gaming side and just, I guess, TVs in general. At least when I see commercials on the internet and when I hear talk of TV, I don't really hear Sony come up all too often. I know back in the picture tube day and when LCD TVs like flat screen TVs were becoming a big trend around the world or around America, I do remember Sony kind of being a big deal. But now in the future, it's mostly a lot of people talking about LG this and LG that, at least when it comes to uh, TV uh when it comes to TV brands, but I guess that does make sense just because LG is known for their AMOLED or OLED displays and they make some of the best TVs money can buy in terms of the picture quality and in terms of how they actually function. They are some of the most amazing TVs on the market. If you want some of the best uh, TVs money can buy, it is always going to be that LG name. So many people swear by LG and honestly, I have seen LG TVs and I think LG TVs are in, in a league of their own. They're some amazing panels and apparently they do make uh two different models here it looks like they do make a uh, 4k model and i think i saw somewhere correct me if i'm wrong but i think i saw somewhere they did say they did make an 8k model obviously uh the ps5 is not going to play games in 8k so don't get your hopes up on that but i heard apparently i do believe as far as i remember i think the ps5 and the xbox series x are actually going to allow 8k streaming on that yes i know 8k is not really a thing for a lot of different consumers because where's the content for and second of all where's the tvs for the 8k 8k tvs are still 
a little bit too expensive for most households. So most ho households actually end up buying things like 4K TVs since 4K TVs are dirt cheap and everyone pretty much has a, a 4K TV at this point or at least can uh, upgrade to a 4K TV uh, very cheap. And it looks like all these TVs from this article are actually going to allow higher refresh rates of 120 hertz. They're trying to make sure you can take full advantage of these systems because again, the PS5 and the Xbox Series X apparently are gonna be the first systems ever made, at least when it comes to gaming consoles that are gonna be ready for higher refresh rates of 60 uh, frames per second. Uh, compared to usually, because usually when they come out, they're usually geared around 30 to 60 uh, frames per second. Granted, not every game is going to play at 60 frames per second or not play at uh, 120 hertz, just because if you look at what the... Uh, what the game developers can do. Not every game developer, again, optimizes their game for 120 hertz. Maybe this generation is going to be the first generation. They might have, uh, they might let you customize the settings for these uh, systems just like a gaming PC. I know with some games back on the uh, PS4 uh, Pro and the Xbox Series X, or not the Series X, the Xbox One X, I know Microsoft really does have some uh, frustrating names, but are. Yeah, frustrating names, but when you look at those systems, they did actually have uh, some sliders in some games. It was up to the, the developers, and a lot of developers would let you choose between performance or graphics, so it was nice. I'm actually hoping with the PS5 and the Xbox Series X, developers allow you to switch from graphics mode to performance mode if you want higher refresh rate, but but maybe 1080p visuals, or if you want better visuals, but only have like a 60 frames per second experience, let the user choose. I hope it's not just with each individual dev. I hope it actually goes a little bit farther than that. I actually hope it goes to the point to where maybe the system itself actually has those settings baked into the system to let you play with those uh, settings as well. And then yes, they are talking about an 8K model as well. The Z8H are Sony's latest 8K, 8K TVs, but of course, for most people, those are out of touch. And 4K is still some pretty amazing uh, technology. It is very interesting that they're really trying to push these Sony Bravia TV TVs on people for the next upcoming PlayStation 5. Keep in mind, these are just what Sony actually recommends. And of course, since Sony does make TVs, they are going to recommend these Bravia TVs, of course. I'm not going to recommend any other brands since they're trying to push their own brand. Doesn't mean other TVs will work beautiful with the uh, PS5 and the Xbox Series. Series X. Of course, other TV brands will just work fine. And in some instances, they may, I'm just going to say it now, may work slightly better because they may have better saturation, better colors. It's really going to be up to each individual who really wants to uh, buy a TV for next generation gaming, what type of TV they want to buy and their price point. But I guess Sony's like, well, if you don't know what to buy, we can recommend some nice TVs anyway that you know you'll be getting all the features of the uh, PS5. Like for instance, that higher refresh rate, you will be getting uh, 4K quality. You'll also be getting things like HDR. They didn't leave HDR out in the mix because these are actually going to allow you to have HDR. And HDR is becoming a much more popular thing when it comes to TVs. Of course, why wouldn't you want HDR? Because HDR makes those colors more saturated. It makes those colors actually pop off the screen compared to actually what you have with without HDR technology. So that's something to take in consideration. But these ones just already take those things uh, into consideration as well. So you, so it pretty much check marks all the boxes uh, for the PS5. You won't be missing higher refresh rates, the resolution, and of course HDR. So that's actually uh, very nice. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for this episode. Anyway, guys, this is Wayne from My Tech News signing out.